Hi everyone, thanks so much for listening to another episode of Dogman Encounters Radio. I'm Vic Cundiff and I'll be your host for the show. Before we bring on tonight's guest, if you've had a Dogman Encounter and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. If you've had a Sasquatch sighting and would like to be a guest on Bigfoot Eyewitness Radio, please go to bigfooteyewitness.com and submit a report. Tonight's first guest is Ryan Tremblay. Ryan, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Vic. How you doing? I'm doing great, but more importantly, how are you? I'm doing the best I can in this Arizona heat, just you know, staying safe and sound. Oh, man. Yeah, I can only imagine how hot it must be out that way. Yeah, I believe it's 112 today, so that's not too cool at all. Yeah, I'd say that's hot enough. Ryan, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, I've been into cryptozoology since I was a little kid. I actually uh, started reading out those books that you can get at the library about, you know, just Bigfoot, Chupacabra. I've always been an avid reader, so that really dragged me in. I was hooked since I was a kid. And as I got older, I started finding videos online of Bigfoot and, you know, alleged Chupacabra sightings, a Loch Ness Monster. And then eventually I came across the whole Beast of Bray Road and a Dogman phenomena. And that really, really, really pulled me in. Oh, no, I totally understand. Yeah, I was hooked on cryptids as a kid as well, so I definitely get it. Growing up being hooked on the topic of cryptids the way you were, did you live in an area where cryptids might have been? Yeah, actually, I lived in New England, so we had, you know, forests all around us, and I never really thought anything of it at first. But once I started reading these books, you know, it kind of was that awakening of, oh, there's monsters in those woods, so the movies aren't really lying. So, you know, not like a typical kid, I went out there looking for things that, you know, are actually real. They're not just myth or legends. And most of my friends thought I was crazy for it. But, you know, it was a fun time for me growing up. Oh, I'm sure it was. And yeah, New England, there's some spooky stuff, some crazy, weird things. So, yeah, mm-hmm. you could almost take your pick of cryptids and entities and you name it. Present day, you live close to where sightings have been reported of the Mogollon Monster. How close do you live to the Mogollon Rim? Only a matter of hours away, really. That's actually one of my focal points of research as well. You know, because uh, when we moved to Arizona, a lot of people that I knew were already into cryptozoology and they started telling me about the Mogollon monster. And, you know, being the state monster, everybody knows something about it. And so I've been there a couple of times. I've been in that area a couple of times. And it's a very interesting place. Oh, I'm sure it must be. Speaking of the Mogollon monster, for the uninitiated, what can you tell us about it or him or her? Well, from what I've learned so far, it's a type of Bigfoot, but it has a very aggressive nature. It's not like the Patty type that, you know, Patterson and Gimlin had filmed. This one tends to chase people out of the woods or it tends to stalk the campers that are out there. And people have described it as looking like a, uh, a chimpanzee, a very large chimpanzee that's just beyond normal aggression. Ooh, sounds like a good area to stay away from then. Oh, yeah. You want to be careful when you go out there. Make sure your head's on a swivel at all times. Yeah, that sounds like good advice to me. You used to doubt that dog men existed before you had an encounter of your own. How sure were you before you had your encounter that dog men didn't exist? Uh, I would say it was maybe a 75% chance that I believe it just didn't exist because the whole the werewolf thing just seemed too far fetched for me. It seemed too, too supernatural. You know, it seemed more something along the lines that you would see strictly in the movies. And so I didn't really pay it much mind. But, you know, that did change drastically one night, so. From what you told me about the encounter, I'd say that it did. How long had you been researching cryptids before you had that encounter? Let's see, I started maybe when I was nine, really looking into this. So, I would say about 20-something years when I had the encounter. You know, so that that reason right there, when the dogman became a reality, you know, that kind of changed everything that I thought about cryptids. Yeah, there's nothing like seeing to become a believer. Sounds like you got a real crash course, unfortunately. Um, you know, I wouldn't even say unfortunately, Vic. I, I view it now as a, a blessing in a way. You know, because a lot of us cryptozoologists, we go out there and we want to find something and we never see anything in the flesh. But I was given that chance to see it just mere 15 feet away. You know, so while it might have been traumatic at the moment, later on it really turned out to be a real blessing for me. Yeah, as far as encounters go, I think you were let off easy. If you have to have an encounter with a dog man the kind that you had, that's definitely what I think someone should shoot for. 
Certain movies help to fuel your interest in cryptids. Please expand on that for us. Well, as a kid, I used to watch the Godzilla movies. And, you know, as a kid, you always want to fantasize that giant monsters are real. You know, and that was something that I did. I used to build models and collect toys of monsters, always thinking that, you know, these things could be real somehow. And then as I got older, I was allowed to watch horror movies, American Werewolf in London being literally my first werewolf movie that I watched. And the monster in that movie was just so fascinating and so brilliantly done that it became a favorite thing to me. So I started branching out watching The Howling and whatever werewolf movie I could get my hands on to watch. You know, and then Harry and the Hendersons, that was a big motivator as well. That was a great movie. It was funny, but, you know, so that influenced my love for Bigfoot, the first Sasquatch. So the very first horror movie that you ever saw was an American werewolf in London. Wow, that's a really rough start. Yeah, I was actually kind of traumatized in a way, not in a really horrendous way, but I was afraid to go out at night after I saw that movie. And I refused to walk off path. If we went anywhere, I would not walk off the path just because of what happened in the movie. I was careful to always stay on the roads. Yeah, remember that advice from the movie, stay on the mm -hmm. road. Yeah, even though Massachusetts had no moors, you know, it was just something that was ingrained in me to stay on the roads. Well, depending on the weather that you get in Massachusetts, it can look like you've got moors around you. <laughs> Very true. That's right. You co-host a paranormal show. What more can you tell us about that? Oh, yes. I co-host The Venomous Fringe with Chris Cyrus. And we cover encounters. We'll narrate encounters. We'll have guests who speak about their encounters. It's a very interesting show. If you want to check it out, I would advise you to do so. If the listeners do want to check it out, which I hope they do, what's the easiest way to do so? You can find us on YouTube under The Venomous Fringe. You can check out our Facebook group also on The Venomous Fringe. Or you can reach Chris Cyrus or myself at Twitter. Well, that makes it easy. Because of you being so well known in the cryptid field, eyewitnesses contact you and share their encounters with you. What kinds of entities and cryptids do they tell you about seeing? Oh, I've heard the range of the mill. I've heard goat man, lizard man. I've heard a few stories about the deer man, which I find very fascinating. A couple of Wendigo cases, which again, the Wendigo really, that scares me. So I don't really delve too much into that one. But I've heard a lot of dogman and Sasquatch encounters as of late. Yeah, there is something about Wendigos that seems extra creepy. I think it's their demonic origins that really scare us so much. Yeah, that would explain it. Do you try to help these eyewitnesses who contact you deal with those encounters, or do you just listen to them talk to you about their experiences? I tend to do the best I can to help them. I've actually helped a couple of people already, and it's kind of hard to help people, as you know, Vic, that sometimes you just can't help them recover completely. It has to come from themselves. But if they need somebody to listen or just talk to you, I'm always there for them. You're a good man for doing that. Thank you. You're welcome. Just telling the truth, though. All right, Ryan, please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, well, I need to preface it a little bit. There's a story that goes with this before the actual encounter happened. Um, around my friend's housing community, there was talk of how a dog had gone missing, a medium breed dog. And most of the people in the neighborhood, just we dismissed it and just thought, you know, it might have been a coyote or a group of coyotes or a mountain lion, because we do get mountain lions in this place now and again. So, you know, nothing happened with that. The police didn't really look, but then more dogs started missing gradually. So that kind of caught my interest. I was wondering what was really doing this. And during all this, my friend had gone away on vacation with his wife and he asked me to watch his home. So I would go, I would check morning, noon, night, usually around midnight to do my final check. So on the night of my encounter, I had gone about 12, maybe 1230, the latest to go and check. And it was a cool October night. It wasn't too hot. It wasn't too cold. And, you know, no full moon, just typical Arizona night. And while I was out back checking his backyard, I had heard some sounds coming from the edge of his property. And at first I thought it could have been maybe a passing animal or a vagrant, because in this town, we actually have a problem with vagrants coming up from the wash and taking residence in the woods near someone's house. So when I heard these noises, I yelled out, hey, hoping to get a response. And there was nothing at first. So I kept hearing these noises and again, I yelled out, hey, and the second time I was met by this long guttural growl. And upon first instinct, I thought, you know, mountain lion again. So I just, I paused and I could hear this thing growling and huffing like a bear would do the really deep breaths. 
And so I just, I froze. I didn't want to move. And I could hear these twigs snapping and the rocks moving. And as it was getting closer, he had some security lights in the back. I could see the security lights come on and the light was reflecting from this thing's eyes, giving off an amber light glow. And as it got closer, I could see it was staring directly at me. And by coincidence, I was staring directly at it. And it just, it stood there for a moment, just looking before it moved a little bit closer. And it just stood there. It just stared at me and I could see the ears going up and down. You know, and I didn't really have the courage to say anything or scream or try to run because I just, I didn't know what I was looking at. And so this thing got closer and slowly it reared up on its hind legs. I could hear that popping noise that so many people hear. And it stood there just waiting, just looking at me. And I could see its head now starting to tilt a little bit. Then it would tilt to the other side and then the other side back and back and back. And as it did so, I could see its lips, its upper lips will lift up. So it was making that sneer that I, you know, had read about the Beast of Bray Road. And I just, I didn't know what to do. I was for some reason just rooted in place. You know, and I probably should have ran. Logic would have said run, get inside the house. But for some reason, it just was not within me. And, you know, we were staring at each other for what seemed like minutes before this thing charged forward a little bit. And I'm guessing when it charged like that, it wanted to see if maybe I would run, which would be a predator prey response, or if I'd pull a weapon. And because I didn't do so, it just, it abruptly stopped and it continued to stare at me for just a few more minutes. And then it slowly started to back away and I could hear it as it was leaving. It was doing that huffing breathing again, a very deep huh, huh, as it was walking off. And when it was out of sight, I just, I ran into my friend's house and I just locked the doors, bolted the windows. And it was a very frightening experience because, you know, at a friend's house, you don't know where he keeps the weapons, the knives, the guns, or if he even has any. Whereas at your house, you would know where everything is. So it was just one of those things where I didn't really know what to do. So I called him up after I returned to my own house and I told him, yo, there's something in your backyard. You know, you got to be really careful when you come back home. And at first he just thought, you know, bear, mountain lion, same thing I thought. And when he came home, we went back during the day. I went back to the very same spot where we, I had seen that. And you could see where the branches were broken higher up. And there were scratches in the ground, deep claw marks in the ground. How long did it take you before you could actually wrap your head around what happened to you that night to the point that you could actually function, go out at night and do what you needed to do without too much trouble? You know, wrapping my head around what it was took maybe a matter of a week because really I, you know, it looks so hyena and so canine to me. It just it made no sense to me. You know, as somebody who doubted the werewolf and dogman thing, when I saw something like that, I just couldn't make any sense of it. I couldn't make heads or tails. And after that, you know, going out, taking the trash out during the nighttime or going anywhere by myself at night or even returning to my friend's house was a very difficult thing for me. I mean, it was not something I was super terrified of, but I was very nervous because I was so terrified that this thing was going to be waiting somewhere else. I was anxious that this thing, it was going to be waiting behind every corner, nervous that it was hiding behind trees or going to be even hiding behind the dumpsters. Yeah, you know, that might sound crazy, but when you see something like this for your, yourself firsthand, you know, you just, you honestly don't know what to make of it. And I think anyone who's had an encounter can agree that your world changes. Everything seems so different. Everything seems so much bigger, yet smaller at the same time, if that makes any sense. Oh, sure it does. Yeah, of course, there's life free of the encounter, and then there's life after. Please describe it for us as accurately as you can from top to bottom. Okay, best way I can describe this is when you think of the face of a hyena, that's exactly what this thing had. It had the same muzzle, the same rounded ears, the tuft of fur on the top of the head, you know, the same eyes that were set kind of far apart. The teeth were almost identical. As far as the coloring goes, I'm going to have to say it was probably a dark, dark, dirty blonde with a few spots on it like a hyena would have. And as far as the build goes, the build wasn't like most people describe when they talk bodybuilder type it was more a athletic build if like a basketball player if i had to really liken it to anything else and it was tall it was about six and a half maybe near seven feet tall and its arms were very long the front arms were down past the knees and you could see the knuckles were touching the ground but if it had a tail i didn't see any tail i just saw the canine legs that it had and you know nothing on the back was there any kind of a pattern that you noticed to its spots? Uh, not readily. It was so dark that really, you know, I just couldn't see what the spots were really like. 
it's just, you know, I was too entranced, I think, to really take in too much detail on the spots. Oh, no, I totally understand. You have a dog man standing right in front of you that's not supposed to exist in the first place. Yeah, you're doing good to know your own name. So, yeah, no one can exactly. fault you for that. But as far as the spots went, do you remember where they were located on the dog man? Uh, from what I could see, there was more spots along the shoulders where the biceps and the triceps would be and then going along its neck. Yeah, that had to be quite the sight to see. Absolutely. I'm sure it was. When it stood up onto its back legs, did it almost seem to totally morph into a different animal, or did it somewhat look like the same animal that was just upright? It somewhat looked like the same animal. It just took an upright position. You know, and it seemed to do it with fluid ease, too. There was no interruption, no flaws in it. It just stood right upright. With most eyewitnesses, when they see the dogman that they encounter, it definitely throws them for a loop. But for the ones where the dogman stands up onto its back legs, that's when it gets real. That's mm -hmm. when most eyewitnesses really start having a hard time dealing with it. With you, did that really make you real when it stood up onto its back legs? And before that point, you were somewhat holding it together, or did all of your composure just go out the window the moment that you saw that dogman? Oh, all the composure just, it left the minute it rose up like that. Because, you know, once it rises up on two legs, you can't fool yourself into thinking it's an average animal. You know, when it's on all fours, you could easily tell yourself, oh, no, no, that was just something else. That was a dog or whatever. But when it stands up on two legs and you see it has arms, you're at the point where you can't deny it any longer. You have to admit to yourself that was a dog man or a werewolf, whatever you want to call them. Your mind has to grasp that that is what was in front of you. That is what you saw. Yeah, until you had that encounter, you could deny it all you wanted to, but once you had one standing in front of you, that goes out the window. Before you did have that encounter, if someone approached you to talk with you about a dogman encounter they had, would you have laughed at them, made fun of them, or just listened but doubted what they were saying? Oh, no, I wouldn't have laughed or doubted them. I would have gladly listened, but I would have offered other ideas as to maybe it was a misidentified Sasquatch that they had seen. Because I know there's a Sasquatch that has a snout, the Gugwe. So I would offer the theory that maybe it was one of these that they had seen or, you know, something along those lines. But I would never laugh at them for that, and especially now. No. Yeah, considering your makeup, your personality, I seriously doubted that you ever would have laughed at anyone. But just to be thorough, I thought I'd throw that out there. And by the way, Gugwe, contrary mm -hmm. to what a lot of people believe, Gugwe are not a kind of Sasquatch, but I'm not going to get on my soapbox on that here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I could make a whole show on that, but yeah, I'm not going to do that. There was something about its appearance that really threw you for a loop. Please expand on that for us. It was just the whole hyena-like appearance of it. You know, I've always heard about the the wolf type of dogman that people see, how it looks like a, you know, a timber wolf or a dog of like a German Shepherd or a Husky. And I never really contemplated that there would be a hyena like dog man. It just didn't make sense to me given that hyenas aren't really canine anyway. So to see something that is known as a dog man that looks just like a hyena, it just didn't make any sense to me. But as I started doing research after this, I heard that more and more people had seen a type two variant like I had seen. So it started me researching on this and I did learn that a long time ago, there was a prehistoric dog that was a dog. It was a canine, but it looked like a hyena. So now it all made sense to me. It was all falling in places like a pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah, there's something about the hyena types that's just extra creepy. You know, I think with the hyenas, I think it's because we see those nature shows, you know, and we see how violent and how dangerous hyenas can be. So when something that's upright, that's bipedal, has a appearance like a hyena we assume it's got the behavior the nature of a hyena and we're terrified that they're going to be that aggressive with us yeah there is something about hyenas it's just so hard to tell what they're going to do from one moment to the next i mm -hmm. guess if you have an encounter with a hyena looking dog man you just hope that doesn't hold true with them as well because if it does then yeah it's not going to go well yeah you're in trouble at that point oh no doubt when it was standing there, moving its ears the way it did, did it seem to have an expression on its face? There seemed to be almost a look of bewilderment on its face, like it was wondering why I wasn't running away or acting aggressive. You know, and it just, it stared, but you could see its eyes just going side to side a little bit too, as if itself was trying to avoid eye contact. 
Wow, I can only imagine the things that were going through your mind when you were standing there looking at it just 15 feet away. That's close. Yeah, and I think about that. And, you know, that would be a minimal space for that thing to have covered in no time. So I don't think it really meant any harm. I think it was more curious about me than I really want to realize at that point. Because you hear stories of how fast these things are, how they can move in the blink of an eye and be on you. So to think about how close that was, you know, that thing could have taken me at any moment. Oh, sure it could have. When you do field research, are you compromised in any way because of that encounter? You know, I used to be. When I first got into research again after the encounter, I was extremely reluctant to go too far out by myself. But, you know, as I mentioned before, once I started realizing what it was and came to grips with it, I actually went deeper out to where I was investigating and I was hoping for another encounter. I'm not afraid of them as I probably should be, but... I go out there hoping I'll see the same one or maybe a similar one or maybe even a pack of them. But I was very, very careful. And I still am. I always have my head on a swivel. My eyes are wide open. My ears are open. I don't take any unnecessary chances. Yeah, whether dogmen are out there or Sasquatch, you name it, it's still a great idea to be wary and careful when you're in the woods. So I'm glad you do that. You disagree with the notion that dogmen are evil. Please expand on that for us. Well, I wouldn't say I totally disagree. I just, I believe, I have a theory that they react to how we react. And since they're still animals in a way. So if we respond with violence, it's only natural that they're going to respond with violence. I think if you keep your calm and you keep your wits and you don't do anything that you should not do, i.e. try to draw a gun, try to challenge them in any way, you can avoid those violent interactions. And for that, what I did is I did research on just known animals and what you should and shouldn't do. And with a lot of canines, looking them right in the eye is taken as a challenge. And even how you carry yourself, canines can feel threatened by how you're holding your composure. So I always try to remain more calm, more relaxed, because I feel if this comes up again, you can avoid an interaction that would be considered evil by most people. Yeah, that sounds like good advice to me. Why push the issue? Why do something that might cause a problem or if you didn't do it, it might be somewhat smooth sailing? Being a host of a show the way you are, I've got to ask you about this. Because, like me, you've taken heat on this. What are your thoughts on all the people who seem to want to seek out dogman encounters on a whim with no preparation? Oh, goodness. That is something I've taken so much heat for. Whenever somebody who's never been camping tells me, oh, I'm going to get this particular kind of gun and I'm going to go find Dogman, I tell them, you know, there's so much more to worry about out there instead of just cryptids. You have other animals. You have rattlesnakes, copperheads. You have predatory animals, bears, wolves, mountain lions. And then you get the human nature. You know, you have those humans that aren't tightly wrapped that could probably and will hurt you more than a cryptid will. And that is if you find a cryptid. So I tell them, no, don't go running out there like Rambo. Learn about camping. Learn about going outdoors. Go with friends at first. Go with family at first. Be an outdoorsman before you go running out there trying to conquer the cryptids. It's just not a good idea. Huh. Yeah, it never ceases to amaze me. You have people contacting you. I know I've got people contacting me, and you think, wow, this person's got no business leaving the city, let alone <laughs> heading into the woods to try and seek out a dogman encounter. Yeah, I've had plenty of those people. I've had guys tell me they're pretty much getting military issue guns and armor to go out in the woods. And I told them that won't keep you alive if you break your legs in the middle of nowhere. You know, you have to learn survival techniques, what to do, what not to do, which ways to go, how to read a compass, how to read a map. Oh, of course. I shudder to think what might happen if some of these people actually ever do head out and try to seek out an encounter. Not for the reasons of necessarily them having an encounter, but the reasons you just mentioned, all the other things that can happen to you in the woods. Oh, yeah. The dangers are pretty much limitless, especially in, you know, nowadays where people just don't care about other people, really. So, you know, you could happen across someone who's not all there mentally. And just because you ran into them, well, there you go. You know, you might not come back home. Yeah, that just might be the last mistake you make, unfortunately. Mm -hmm, sadly. Living near the Mogollon Rim the way you do, have you heard of any dogman encounters happening out that way? Yeah, there's plenty of them. I mean, after my encounter, I started gathering more and more reports. And, you know, there's people in Tucson that are seeing these things near a mountain, Mount Lemon, you know, and it's really fascinating to actually hear how many sightings there really are. 
in this area. And I've been to all these mountain ranges in Arizona, Mount Lemon, a mountain ring cons. And when you go out there and you really, really look at the wilderness that's out there, you can definitely say for sure, Oh, there's things out here. These things could very well be out here. And I've spoken to some of the older people in this town and they tell me older stories of how people had seen Dogman running around this town was nothing more than the mining town. Yeah, when you look at that area on a map, look at a satellite view of that area, it looks like it'd be the perfect place for Sasquatch, Dogman, you name it, to hide and live and thrive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something that a lot of people forget about this town is, like I mentioned just previously, it used to be a mining town. So there's a lot of abandoned mines that nobody goes to anymore. And there's a lot of riverbeds as well that have the tunnels and, you know, that'd be a perfect place for something to seek refuge from the heat during the summer, but it would also keep them sheltered during the winter time. And there's a lot of edible plants that if something were an omnivore, it could feast on those. And there's smaller prey. We have rabbits, cottontails, jackrabbits. We have quail, we have road runners, you know, we have some deer that come through here occasionally as well. So it would be the perfect ground for something like a dogman or a Sasquatch to exist in and do so healthily. Yeah, when you look at a satellite view of that area, it sure looks like a great place for dogmen, Sasquatch, you name it, any kind of a cryptid to live. So it's no surprise that you find them there. If you have another encounter someday with a dogman, Ryan, what do you think you'd do differently? Uh, I think in a way I would imitate what I did during the original encounter by freezing in place and not looking this thing in the eye. But I would hope this time I actually had a really good camera that I could start up so I could get this thing on footage and really analyze the footage and get to recognize the body language, the mannerisms, and just focus on that and maybe offer that to my other fellow researchers so we could know this is how they behave. And this gives us an indication of what it wants to do when it's in your presence. And I would hope that would actually maybe lead to some kind of revelation down the road. If you do have another encounter with a dog man someday and you do happen to have a camera hanging from your neck, how mm -hmm. sure are you or aren't you that you're going to have the wherewithal to actually pick up that camera and try and snap a photo and not be so shell shocked that you forget to do that? I can't be sure. I might have to stick a sticky note to my forehead to remind myself, but I would do my best to do what I could to get that photo. I mean, probably the last thing you want to do when you're face to face with one is raise anything up because they're not going to know the difference between a camera and a gun. So I would hope that maybe I already had camera in position. So all I'd have to do is hit that button. Well, you know what they say, everyone's got a plan until they get hit. I guess the sure. same thing could be said about a dogman encounter. Everyone has sure. a plan until they have an encounter with one. Yeah, that's very, very true. Oh yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Well, having said that, Ryan, it's about time for us to get out of here. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yeah, just when you go out there, people, just be careful. You never know just when you're going to have an encounter with one of these things. So my best advice, don't act violently towards them. And maybe, just maybe, you'll have a peaceful encounter that the rest of us are hoping for. And please, be kind to each other out there and take care of one another. Very well said. Very well said. Well, Ryan, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me on, Vic. It's been a pleasure. Oh, likewise. Thank you for your time. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. Before we bring on tonight's second guest, I want to share something with you. If you love listening to the show, but you hate listening to the commercials, there's a way to listen commercial free. To find out how, please go to dogmanencounters.com forward slash podcast. All right, let's bring on tonight's second guest. Tonight's second guest is Matt. Matt, welcome to the show. Glad to be here, Vic. Well, it's great having you. Thanks so much for your time. Matt, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Well, my name is Matt. I'm 57 years old. I've got a unique background of military and law enforcement, uh, school teaching also. I'm an avid trainer. I end up training uh, military personnel. I train law enforcement personnel and other individuals. Done a lot of school teaching, uh, got a couple college degrees, 13 plus years, United States Army Special Forces, and about 10 years in law enforcement, three different states. Moved around a lot, uh, married, got two beautiful children with my wife. Uh, we met in Afghanistan, so it's 
interesting uh, war romance story there. Uh, been around the world a few times, seen a lot of strange things. Uh, I've always taught everyone and trained everybody, expect the unexpected, so that when you do encounter it, you don't go into the fight or flight mode uh, without some sort of mental preparation because if your mind's not engaged, you come away scarred more than often. Um, done a lot of interesting things, did time overseas, got some trigger time in uh, with my A-team, done a lot of things over there, very interesting time, uh, seen a lot, done a lot. I'm not a hero, I'm just an average guy who's had a unique background. Uh, that pretty much sums me up. Well, that's a lot to sum you up. You've been busy in your 57 years. Yes, sir. It's, it's been quite an experience. Oh, it sounds like it. Well, before we continue, I just want to thank you so much for your service to our country. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're very welcome. It, uh, it changed my life for the better in many, many ways. So definitely, I've got a better half for that now. <laughs> well, as long as you can say that, it's a good thing. Not only did you spend over 13 years in Army Special Forces, Matt, you have law enforcement experience, too. Have you used your special training to your advantage when it comes to dealing with the encounter you had? Yes. The training I got in the military, again, like I said, expect the unexpected and be ready for anything to happen. It helped me quickly understand what I was seeing, and immediately I went into the, uh, the observation mode of, of taking in details of what I was witnessing. Uh, even as incredible as it was, I wasn't totally shocked with it when I saw this creature. I immediately started going, okay, from head to toe, write down in your mind what you are seeing. Take notes. And, you know, thanks to some of the training I've had, both law enforcement and military, uh, when you're doing intel gathering, stuff like that, every little detail counts and you make mental notes of it and store it away so you can uh, repeat it later in a report format. Uh, what you don't think is vital could be very vital in a, in a different way to somebody else. So I've, I've learned to be able to observe something and make a mental imprint in my mind so I can look back on it and recall details. And you've got to do it in a good way because some of the times I have to recall that in the court of law uh, under oath uh, giving testimony. Well, who better to have described the dogman they saw than a trained observer? So, yeah, that's definitely a good thing. I'm sure it's not lost on you that the idea has been floated that Special Forces teams are commonly tasked with keeping dogmen and Sasquatch in check. What are your thoughts on that? I would say that's highly possible. I haven't had any of my brothers contact me directly about having to either go after Sasquatch or dogman. Uh, I do know that in the law enforcement community in some areas, they use the term black cow for a Sasquatch problem and black dog for a dogman problem. Uh, and some of the bigger agencies that are more rural and have to deal with those types of situations. As far as the, the military coming in and cleaning up or eradicating that type of problem, I've heard of one instance I saw online. Somebody actually sent it to me and said, hey, is this accurate? And I, could, I couldn't say either way. It's For all my background, looking at what they said this team did, it was actually a, a Navy SEAL team. And I've worked with those guys overseas a bunch. It sounded pretty accurate as to the techniques and the ways they would go about basically uh, taking care of that problem. And I believe that it would be an option. Uh, I think it'd be a last resort option. And quite frankly, all the time I spent in the military and in law enforcement, I personally would not go up against uh, either of those types of cryptids or any of the cryptids that I've read about or heard about without a complete A team or a SEAL team or something of that nature. Because you're in a world where if you don't go in there prepared, you're not going to come back because you're basically going to end up declaring war on these creatures and they're going to defend themselves and their extended family members or whatever the situation may be. I, I don't really believe they totally run around uh, like rogue 
uh, creatures, one, you know, they, they, one here and one there. I think they do roam in groups and there are family, uh, family groups of them that roam around and they've caused problems. So uh, I wouldn't want to go in there with anything less than an, an A team or a SEAL team or people that are trained to be able to handle their emotions uh, under serious stress uh, environments like that. Considering what you just told us about your thoughts on going after one of these things with an A-team, please tell us your thoughts about people who want to try their hand at shooting a dog man with no special training at all. I would advise them to do not do that. Uh, that's a very wrong thing to put yourself in that type of situation. I witnessed this thing. It wasn't even interested in me, but what I saw was something I would not want to try to encounter by myself uh, in any way except as a last resort to defend myself or my family. Uh, I would not advise shooting at these things or trying to confront them in any type of an aggressive nature. Uh, you're asking for the worst scenario to outplay on you. And, you know, if you do that, you may end up in one of those 411 missing books as just another statistic. There's just no telling. Uh, it's, that's not a good choice at all. No, definitely. Yeah, there are quite a few people who just want to go out and seek out encounters with these things and be totally unprepared for it. From what I understand, your wife is a fan of the show. Did she listen to the show before you had the encounter that we're going to talk about tonight, or did that only start after you had that encounter? No, Vic. Uh, we found your show while we were actually researching uh, Bigfoot while we lived up in uh, the Fortress area of New Mexico. And I heard about some uh, law enforcement officers that basically they got run off a mountain. Uh, it's called Devil's Mountain. And uh, it's between Durango and Pagosa Springs. And I read about them getting run off the mountain. So we started looking at it and then we, we basically found this thing called Dogman. And uh, I was like, wow, what's that? And, uh, of course, my children were watching um, the movie uh, The Scorpion King and saw the army, army of Anubis and The Rock and everything. And uh, when we first saw the dog, man, I thought, wow, these, uh, this is very interesting. Maybe these are some similar of what they've been talking has been living since B.C. times. Uh, we started doing research on it and we found your show basically we're both actually really good fans of your show it's i enjoy the entertainment of it i empathize with the people going through the pain and suffering uh of the encounters that some of them have had uh, I'm, I'm just grateful that i haven't had that type of an encounter because it's similar to ptsd you get from combat and at least you have the va to help you with that and i i guess the only other thing they've got to go to is you vic for their ptsd which I, you're doing a great job helping them but uh, the wife, we've actually downloaded all of your episodes and we basically listen to you weekly and um, we really enjoy it. Uh, she's a big fan. Uh, she loves what you do with them, uh, especially when you, you, you give them the therapy they need. Uh, it really it touches her to see someone so caring about someone else's pain or of, of any level. Because uh, some people are very traumatized by it and some people aren't. And you reach out and you help them regardless of what level they're at. So, yeah, she's a very big fan. And even my uh, my younger boys, my youngest one is uh, just turned uh, 13. And he knows all about Dogman, Bigfoot, everything, because we're a family that doesn't hide this type of information from our kids. We make sure that they know uh, when we go swimming that there's jellyfish, man of war, there's uh, sharks, there's all sorts of dangers in the water at the beach. You need to be aware of this. You don't need to be blind to it. You don't have to be fearful of it. You just have to be aware of it so you can avoid it if you see signs of it. Well, the same thing is true if you go off in the woods. If you have bear, mountain lion, cougars, uh, all sorts of cats, and you've got your coyotes that when they do run in packs, they will, you know, they have been known to come after people uh, in, if they're in large packs and you're by yourself. Uh, the wife had an experience like that once in California. but. Uh, you know, there are other cryptids out there and your show confirmed my suspicions that there was something else out there. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're all big fans of the show. Well, I'm so glad you all found out about it. And 
Yeah, please thank your wife for listening, and I think she gives me too much credit for helping the people. I just do the best I can to help them. But having said that, Matt, please tell us about your encounter now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay. This happened on Friday, May 29th. Uh, we were driving from New Mexico to Texas. We just moved back. And we were in a great big Coachman RV, which is like a, it's a RV that looks like a school bus, basically, only it's got a big, it's one of the ones that looks like a super bus because it has the big windshield that wraps around the front. Uh, it's about six feet tall. It's a really, really large window, which enables you to see everything in your peripheral vision on your right and your left. Uh, it's, it's wonderful driving. I, I can see everything, which comes into play with the encounter. We were driving down uh, Highway 84 South in the Texas Panhandle. Uh, we were approximately 15, 20 miles north of Snyder on that road. The terrain we were in was a little bit of rolling hills. The road, of course, is always built up and then slopes on the shoulders. Uh, once you got off, there's a two-lane road with a, about three-quarters of a lane on the shoulder on the right. And then there was thick grass, about, oh, two to three feet tall. It led about oh, 20 yards or less, and it was thick woods. There was woods, trees with underbrush. You could not see in, into the woods at all. Uh, we were heading southbound, and the, the weather was cloudy that day, uh, sporadic sunshine during the day. This happened uh, approximately, I believe it was about 8.30 in the evening. Um, it was cloudy, but the, the sun was starting to go down behind the horizon but there was still enough ambient light, but it was a little bit darker with the clouds. It was kind of a dreary looking day, but the temperatures were still up in the uh, upper 80s, low 90s throughout the day as we were driving. We came down, uh, we were coming down the road and it was kind of flat. I was in the right-hand lane. There was a Chrysler four-door car in the left lane and he passed me. And I looked up all the RVs, the big coach RVs. They all have a camera in the rear. So I checked my six, looked in the rear, and there wasn't any traffic behind me for at least 200 yards. And it was way back there in the right lane. So I thought, oh, nobody's going to have to pass me here for a little while. The road, road was relatively flat. And again, the ground sloped on the shoulders, on the, in, the uh, outside shoulder going to the trees, and on the inside shoulder going down and then it apparently got into some kind of thick brush with trees and then it went back up again and then you saw the other uh, traffic lanes uh, heading northbound. Now as we're driving, I'm driving along and I'm, I'm just thinking about, wow, this is great. We're finally back in the great state of Texas and off to the right side uh, corner of my eye and personal vision, I immediately noticed a big brown object suddenly just come out of the woods and I thought whoa what's that I thought immediately I thought deer I thought, oh here comes a deer I better better be on my toes back where we're at in New Mexico uh, insurance rates are real high up there because deer just pop out in front of you all over the place mule deer are four times the size of Texas deer they're giant and you'll wipe out your car if you hit one so you really have to stay alert while you drive well that's a that's a habit of mine so I immediately noticed this movement and as I saw this creature come out of the of the brush it came out it was taller than the grass it looked really big and it was from what i could tell at that point it was brown and i immediately said to my wife and the kids which were behind me in the rv playing a board game at a table or that i said hey look at the coyote well as i finished saying that i immediately replied to myself with that's not a coyote because as I saw this thing, I immediately realized, you're not looking at a coyote. This is something totally different. Now, I've seen coyotes all the time. In fact, we're, uh, we're actually down on uh, Mustang Island in Texas, and we saw a coyote run across in front of our car just a week ago. It was a fairly big one. And then he ran, he paralleled us for about a quarter of a mile, running alongside the shoulder of the road along this fence. And he was just gorgeous animal. He had beautiful colors. And back was was flat while he was running, just gorgeous creature run. And uh, so, you know, we've seen a lot of coyotes. And I saw a lot of them up in New Mexico. They'd come in our property all the time. This was not a coyote. This creature came out, and as soon as I looked at it closely, 
I saw that its back, it had massive uh, upper body and shoulders, and it would throw its arms out like it was reaching for the road in front of it. And then literally, it's, it, it, there's no other way to say it, it had hands that reached out and grabbed the road like it was digging in and pull itself to where its hands were while its hind legs, which were definitely dog uh, canine legs, would come up and meet its hands. And then it would literally vault itself across and it would reach out again for the upcoming, uh, actually, uh, the thing that I noticed immediately on it that I knew it was not a coyote was that it had a sloped back, which to me, the first thing popped into my mind was hyena. And I've seen hyenas in Africa. I've also seen them on a lot of my kids' videos. Uh, really aggressive uh, creatures. I wouldn't want to mess with them. Uh, but they have that sloping back to them. Uh, this thing had that. And I immediately knew it was not a coyote. It, and it was the size of it was unbelievable. Uh, the car, the Chrysler had passed before me. And I know how high the bumper is on that. It's about three, three little over the back where the trunk is and all and this thing was towered above where that had been in my line of sight as i was driving and i thought my gosh this thing is huge um it took and literally shot across the road uh, and i'll describe what i actually from nose to tail as i watched it but it literally shot across the road my eyes i just followed it with my head i turned to the left and i followed it I actually, and be careful, guys, if you ever see one of these things and you're driving, try not to follow it and turn the wheel while you're doing this because I changed lanes and I went in the left lane. Uh, it's a good thing I went on a two-lane highway. Uh, that would have been good. But uh, I changed lanes and was end ended up in the left lane. I corrected myself before I went into the shoulder. I followed my eyes all the way to the other side of the road, and it went into the grass and down into that brush. It didn't even stop. It, this thing... I got the distinct impression it was going to cross that road right then, right there, regardless of whatever was driving on that road. It, it was just determined, the, the mo momentum of it and the movements and everything. It was, it was going to cross the road right then, right, right now. Didn't, didn't want to stop for anything. Uh, from head to toe, as it came out, it looked brown. As it got right in front of me, it was it, was, it might have been 30 feet in front of me at most when it crossed directly in front of me. I saw its front hands and arms reach out, and it got the sh right where the shoulder meets the grass. It took one leap and was already landing in the center of the road, and then it took this other leap, and it was across and landing on the other side of the road into the grass. It just immediately... Bam, it was right across me. I, uh, I looked at it. I immediately went into the observation mode, started look, just trying to make mental notes of every little thing because I knew this was not normal. From its, its face, it had the look of a shepherd with a little bit longer snout, a uh, black nose, brown face. It had uh, shepherd ears that went straight up. When you see the, the shepherds, the German shepherds that are groomed really nice, they have straight ears that go straight up and down. This, however, had tufts of uh, fur coming out the tips of its ears. I did notice that. Uh, didn't see its eyes. Couldn't tell you what color they were. Its mouth was closed, and I didn't see any white teeth sticking out uh, other than this thing. It just was so huge. The head was big. But the shoulders, I saw moving, and I saw the muscles because the fur wasn't that thick. When you go down to the, uh, the bicep and then forearm, it, you could actually see the muscles. And also, it's, uh, it's the front of its chest. I caught a glimpse of that as it came from the right, moving to the left. You could see the chest, and you could see the definition of the muscles, and it was sporadic brown hair on its chest. But you could see the, the actual skin of the animal. As it reached out, the forearms were extended. They were longer than what they should have been. They, they were definitely longer it reached for the road and literally grabbed it. I was like, wow, I've never seen anything reach out and grab like that other than, say, super track stars when they start a race and they're putting their hands out and they grab the, the pavement and they take off running. Uh, it took and it, it shot in front of me from the head into the shoulders that were massive. The back sloped down to a very nice thin waist 
And then you could see the hair on its back. It was like a mane around its shoulders and neck, and it tapered down the center of its back to thinner hair that covered all the back of it. Its legs had hair on it, and they were definitely canine. I saw the hawk. Uh, did not see the toenails or claws or anything like that. It was just, it was just too fast. Um, as it shot across, I noticed the coloring of it. It had splotchy patches of gray mixed in, and gray and black and almost like super color, all kind of like a Brendel colored dog, little spots all in it, stuff in it as it was shot across. But the main color up on its shoulders and its head was brown. Now, it did have a tail. As, it, as I followed it across and it entered into the woods, I did notice the tail. The tail came out, and I would say it would have been about oh, a foot and a half to two feet. But it was, it was interesting because it was not like a shepherd's tail. A lot of the shepherd dogs, their tail, the fur kind of goes down, and it, it's, it's all tucked on the bottom of the tail as it goes out to the tip of the tail. This thing's tail, the hair went out kind of went flat like somebody everybody back in the 70s used to comb their hair in the middle and part it off to the sides it looked like that and it looked like the hair went out and then it was just like trimmed on the edges so it flared out on either side of the tail and went flat uh as it shot out and then of course it went to the tip of the tail it literally shot across the road i would say three and a half four seconds i actually got to look at it uh it if i had a rock in my hand and we were stationary. I could have just, I could have hit it with a rock. It was that close. It was not, and I don't throw that good anymore. Uh, it was not that far away at all. 30 feet, 25, 30 feet in front of the RV, with that big window, uh, clear as day, a little cloudy and overcast, but I could still see it really clear. Uh, just amazing creature. I wasn't, uh, I didn't get a feeling of dread. Uh, I got the distinct impression things cross the road, whether we like it or not. I was grateful it it went when it did and didn't wait a, a couple of milliseconds and then crashed into the side of my RV because uh, that would have hit us hard, I'm sure. But uh, it, it definitely, it just shot across the road. I got the impression that it was a younger one. I don't, I don't really know why it didn't look, it didn't look old. The muscles on it, it, it was just impressive as all get out. Uh, reminded me of what pictures of Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was younger. Uh, the upper body, the actual, uh, the pecs and the, the arms and the, the, the forearms. And it was just amazing the way it gracefully shot across that road as fast as it did. Again, I wasn't scared, but uh, again, I've, I've already had enough drama in my life. I don't need any more. But uh, it, it was definitely a, an awe-aspiring experience to realize that after listening to all your shows, I'm like, oh my gosh, this is what these people are talking about. This could very well be exactly what they're seeing. And then and then the wife was right up there, took her a split second to get up next to me. And I was already looking out my uh, driver's side window as it went in the brush. And she, she missed it. But everybody heard me say, hey, look at this coyote. And then that's not a coyote. And they all rushed to the front. And that's how fast it was. It immediately was gone. The colors of it were gorgeous. Its hair looked scruffy. It wasn't well kept, but again, it wasn't like completely matted or, or, or like disgusting. Again, I was in an RV. I didn't hear anything. I didn't smell anything. Uh, all I did is I saw it. And uh, I literally, after I saw it, I, I kept driving and I, I, I tried rationalizing in my head what I had seen. Uh, I've never seen a bear move like that. And bears don't have that, that sloped back. Uh, that slants downward. I kept thinking, gosh, did a hyena from somebody's exotic zoo get loose or something like that? But then the forward part of the body, the upper body was too big. It was massive. And the arms were just uh, kind of like gorilla-like. They were so long and extended. The forearms were longer than what they should have been. And the hands, I'll never forget seeing the, the actually, I saw the spread of fingers as it reached down, grabbed the road and pulled itself as it leaped across the road, just impressive. Again, I would not ever go looking for these things ever. Uh, they're just too, too awesome. Now, as far as how tall, I can estimate how tall it was based on the shoulders. The car had just passed me previously, and based on my knowledge of the vehicle and how high it was and the angle I was looking at it, as this thing came across, 
the shoulders were, were about a foot taller than the back of that car that had just passed me. It was, it, this thing was massive. It's 300 plus pounds easily. And I'm 177, 180, something like that. This thing was a lot bulkier and bigger than I've ever been in my life. Uh, just incredible. And the speed that it cut across that road was, was just amazing. It was downright amazing. Now, I, I, I know this isn't a very dramatic or exciting uh, encounter, which I don't really want to have one like that. Uh, I'm not a kind of guy who's going to go out looking for these things, and I don't plan to. But at the same time, I remember listening to one of your recent shows. There was a young couple, uh, brother and sister, driving just south of Sweetwater toward, I think it was Coleman or something like that, another episode. And they saw a similar type creature cross the road in front of them. And that was actually just, uh, I was on Highway 84. We hit Snyder in 15 minutes. If you go about another uh, 45 minutes south or so, you end up hitting the main uh, uh, highway and you head east and you're right in Sweetwater. So this is another sighting to let people know that, hey, these things are out there and they're not just not just in one little area. They're all over the place. But you think they may not be there. They're there. Uh, again, a lot of your listeners have said, hey, I got that feeling and everything went quiet and all that. Those are indicators that, you know, those are red flags is what we call those in the military. That's your gut instinct telling you something's about to happen. You need to get ready or get out of there and uh, go, go, you know, leave the area. So that's that's why I came forward, Dick, and I, I contacted you about it because I think it's important that we document that these things are out there so people are aware of it to not let their animals wander around at night and let open the door and say, hey, go outside, do your business, uh, or let their children go outside and play on – attended or not watched over. Um, not that these things are going to attack anybody or that, but, you know, there was that recent attack of something in Turkey that took that young, uh, he was 14 years old, and basically took him out of his house and drug him a thousand feet up the side of a mountain, and they found his body, and he had been basically mauled, and they wrote it off as a uh, dog attack or a wolf attack, which I'm not a aware of any wolves in Kentucky, but uh, there's things out there that we need to be aware of and stay on our guard. So again, that's why I reached out to you, Vic, to let you know that we had had this, uh, this encounter. Well, I'm glad you did reach out and let me know about it. Were any gaps behind you in traffic large enough where it could have crossed the highway unseen if it would have waited for you to pass? Yes, there was at least 200 yards behind me where there was no traffic. I saw one car in my camera that was back there in the right lane. So it could have easily waited a, a second. I would have never seen it. It would have shot across the road and nobody would have known. Yeah, that's pretty typical for them. Do you have any opinions on why it didn't do that and just wait for all the traffic to go by and then cross unseen? I think that this thing decides it's going to do something, and it just does it. It could care less about people, traffic, uh, observers. When it comes to a major interstate like that, I just think it said, well, I'm going, and it went. Uh, it had a determined feel and look to its stride. It didn't even look at me. It just shot across the road as though it was 100% intent on getting across that road in a tr straight line and not stopping for anything. I'm just so grateful it, it went when it did and didn't hesitate because then there's a good chance I probably we wouldn't, wouldn't be contact. Yeah, what you said is right on the money. You weren't adversely affected by the encounter, but was your wife upset about it? No, she wasn't. And I think that's mainly because she didn't see it. Uh, my uh, One of my boys was up in the front seat in the passenger side. Um, he possibly saw it, but uh, we haven't talked about it, and he's hasn't said anything to about it. So I think it actually, I think he actually missed it. But the wife, uh, she missed it. My younger son, they both came running up and looked out the windows, and no one saw it uh, but me. So I, and again, I haven't had any kind of problems with it because, again, I sort of look for everything when I drive now. Uh, 
maybe I'll see a Sasquatch someday across the road. But uh, to see, to actually see one, it was a surprise, but I wasn't shocked by it. It was just something that was unexpected that happened, and I absorbed it in and ran with it and accepted it for what it was. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad that you've taken all this in stride the way you have. That's great. Do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? Yeah, I would. Anybody who has seen one of these things and tries to share their experience with somebody and the people look at them like they're crazy or they laugh at them or whatever, don't go and internalize it. You need to go ahead and call Vic, okay? He will talk to you. You're not alone. Lots of us have seen these creatures, and we can't explain it in any sort of a natural science way. And it, it, there's just no easy way to describe what you're going to see. But don't bottle it up inside. You need to go talk to somebody. Let it out. Contact Vic, okay? Get it off your chest. You're not alone. What you're experiencing, what you're feeling, it's all PTSD related. It's normal. You can deal with it. You can deal with it in a positive way. You can turn around something negative, make it positive, and you can move forward. But don't don't hold it inside. And for those of you thinking about going out and looking for these things, guys, don't do it. Just don't do it. You're asking for trouble. And no matter how well armed you are, no matter how much training you think you have, if you're not going in there with a, a whole contingent of special ops type people, there's a good chance you're not going to come out unscathed. So it's not worth it. Don't, don't even try it. Uh, I, I would advise against that. So, and Vic will help everyone who's had an encounter. Please call him. Well, thanks for the good words. And that all sounds like really good advice. Matt, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing the details of that experience with us. I really appreciate it. You're very welcome, Vic. Thanks for having me on. Well, thanks again for coming on. Thanks again so much. Have a great night. If you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me, whether in private or on the show, please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you.